Welcome back. Let's dig into some of the more advanced setup stuff that I like to do at the beginning. And um, I think the thing that's coming to mind most for me here is often I'll do a lot of stuff with the feet because getting getting accurate foot collisions with ground and stuff is a, is a big deal to me. Um, and it's very tedious to just do it by hand. So I like to do it with two genies built in uh, solvers and controls. So I'll show you a few ways you can do it. And then I'll also show you a few problems and a few solutions to those problems. So let's let's go ahead. Let, I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make a full body IK node, and this isn't really part of what I'm trying to show, but I kind of need something here so I can give you an example. Big pose, and then I'm actually gonna use that group that we made earlier to blast out the full body IK joints, and plug this in. Switch the map using to match by attribute, and now we get our a simple FBIK. Okay, and now I'm just gonna move the foot down here. And there's a few ways we can fix this. Uh, if our joint is accurately to the bottom of wherever the foot is on the skin, we can go as simple as a ray actually. So we could do, I have a ray and then I just ray up at the grid or the second input or whatever we have here. Um, that'll, that would work if so like here, when, when I go under the grid, it'll ray it back up. So you can see it's doing there. The issue here, obviously, is that our joint isn't actually, if I click uh, clear here, our joint isn't actually at the bottom of our foot. So we need some sort of offset or some sort of lift coming off of the joint when we push it towards a surface. And now there's kind of a solution for that uh, if we drop a rig buff. And then we plug in uh, our mesh. Also, if we're plugging in like meshes and stuff into a rig bop, I'm going to delete the ray, uh, then it's going to give us an error out of the gate, and that's because it's trying to compute transforms and stuff on it, and this grid uh, doesn't have any transform attributes, so uh, we don't want to give it any transform attributes because we don't really want to treat it like a rig, so we just want to turn off that compute transforms on input two. Okay, and now if I go in the viewport inside of the rig attribute VOP, and I turn off enable output, so the reason I'm turning this off is because if I hover over this with it on, you usually get, oh, maybe they fixed it. Oh, they did. Uh, all right, well, in older versions of Dini, if you're on 19, uh, then this will actually bring in the output as well, and you typically don't want that. So uh, I'm just going to lasso these guys and then bring them in. And now you have this node in here called Collide Geometry. And if you've ever done anything inside of one of these reattribute bops, you know you have a get point transform and a set point transform. And it's pretty easy to just drag over the point number into the set point transform. And now I can plug in the X form from our point where it's getting the point. And then I can set it with an updated collision geometry node. And for this, we want to actually, we can specify a path to like a SOP here. Or since we're plugging this straight in, we can just do second input. And it's not doing anything by default right now just because our joint isn't actually colliding with anything. However, if we move this collision distance, you can see now that this is kind of our offset that I was talking about earlier. So if I have a set to say one here, then this joint has to be one unit above wherever the surface is of the collision geometry. Now that's nice. However, it's a little bit of a pain in the ass to go through and set these manually uh, one by one. So then and, and you can set this for every joint, honestly, because if we had, say, our hip on the ground here, we probably want our hip to be whatever distance the hip joint to uh, the bottom of the skin is here. And we probably want that set too. So we can set them for everything. And I'll, I'll show you some uh, cool way to do that and a cool accurate procedural way to set all of this up. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be hopping out of here and then up at the top, I'm going to take the rest skin. I'm also going to hide everything, turn off the material, and then I'll do a... Uh, okay, so that, the idea here, I guess, is that we need to isolate the areas of influence for each joint. And an easy way to do that is this labs node called name from capture weights. And you can do this if you want to see what it's doing inside. It's basically just unpacking the capture attributes and then getting basically the, the highest weight out of the array. You don't really need to worry about that too much because this thing just does it for you. Uh, I'll probably show how to do some fancy stuff with the unpack attribute here later in this series. But for now, we're just going to use this node. And what it does is it creates a name attribute on the points 
and the name that it spits out is the name of the joint that has the highest influence in that area. And I can visualize that with a color node, and I'll do random from attribute and name. And now you can see we have all these little patches of uh, named of different names of joints, I guess, uh, that correspond to the highest weight area. And so that's great. Uh, why do we care about that? And we care about that because let's say let's say I'm working on the hip joint. Or let's say I'm working on the knee joint, and I want to array it down at the geometry and get the distance that it's using to ray the joint onto the skin downwards, and then use that as the collision distance. However, the farthest distance is going to be the bottom of this foot, and we don't really want that for this joint because we really only want maybe like here. So what we want to do is we want to get these, these areas, and then we want to put it inside of a for each loop. And we're going to use a for each named primitive. We're going to plug this in. And now it actually generated the attribute on the points here, so we probably want to promote that. I think this mesh already does have uh, a name attribute on the primitives, but that shouldn't be a big deal since we're not really actually outputting any of this. We're just using this to get the distance, the collision distance attribute. Oh, not bone capture, uh, name. So now we have our name up here. And when we sort through this, see, we get, I'm just going to turn off this template. We get our little sections of joint geometry. That's cool. Uh, how do we really use this? So what we want to do here in this for each loop is we want to create a input here. I just like to have this button because it's nice to press. I don't actually want the metadata. I just want to fetch the input. And I'll pull this over here. And now we want to bring in our skeleton. And cool, we're bringing that in every time. Uh, so now we need to isolate just the joint of the current iteration. So we're going to do that in a wrangle. So I plug the wrangle in here and the aux uh, and the that for each begin in here, I can do a if at s at name of oh, uh, s at name does not equal. Well, let's actually do prim here because they're on the prim shoot now. So I'll go prim one, I'll go name. It doesn't matter uh, on a per each primitive basis. So you can just use zero for the prim number because all of these primitives should have the same name. So if it doesn't equal that, then we're going to remove points. So now we have only our isolated joint with a matching name. So you can see our name is ankle. And if we visualize this, we are also grabbing the ankle. All right, cool. Now, so the next step is to get that distance. And your first thought might be just to ray it down. And I'll do projection rays, vector, negative one. And this works in a lot of cases. However, there is a good deal of times where so there's a good deal of times where the start points won't be directly above anything. Like say this mesh here was clipped like right here. And like hell for just example's sake, I'll clip it. So now when we ray it, it's not gonna have anything to ray downwards to. So uh, the best, most accurate way, in my opinion, to get this working is just to bound this here. So I'll do a bound, and then I'll bound it, and I'll orient it. Bounding box usually works better. Sometimes you, you can use sphere here. It, it's not a huge deal. You can play around with what you like for this. But here, we're not actually going to even transform the points. We're just going to get the point intersection distance, and we're going to intersect the farthest surface. So now we have this distance attribute. And we can go ahead. Now we have distance attributes on everything. So now these are our distances. Yeah, these okay. okay. So now these are our distances for the collision distance that we're we're working with. So let's move this over here. And then all I really want to do is I just want to copy. I don't actually want to use this because it it just gets messy. I don't wanna I don't wanna plug this in. I I because we're not really feeding it to the points directly. We're using this fetch input and it gets messy with everything. So I'm just going to copy that distance attribute over using the name attribute. And let's go there and we'll go rematch name. And now we have these guys with the distance attribute and that's great. So I'm going to move this up, give ourselves some more space. Okay. And now when we go down into the retribute bob, we should still have that distance attribute. And what we can do is we can do an import point attribute and we can plug that point number of this thing. So 
we have the point number and we have the point number of whatever we're grabbing right here. So we can plug that in and then we can say we're grabbing it from the first input and we want to grab the disk and it is also a float. So now we plug that into the distance and I'm going to go ahead and show everything again. And now we have very accurate collisions you can see with the ground. And now I'm going to show you one more little thing actually here. So one other cool thing is sometimes doing this by hand is very annoying also because you got to grab every point and in this scenario we only are using a few but if you had like a spider or something or something with a lot of legs or something i mean not even a lot of legs just a lot of joints in general it could get very very tedious to do all of this so a cool way you can work inside of a vop with these points is you can do uh, get point transforms and what get point transforms is going to do is it's actually going to return an array and so that's an array of points and if, if you don't know what an array is <laughs> think of it like a group of uh a group of numbers and like a list essentially and the list is going to contain the point number and for each point number, it's going to uh, have the transforms and local transforms and inside of this list we can do a for each loop so what this is going to do is it's going to take it's going to take an array and it's going to loop over i'm going to delete or not delete these but i'm going to disable them for now it's going to loop over each number in that list so we're now looping over each point in all of the points from the first input so what we can do there is we can basically copy this setup here and we'll go element out and what we want to do here is now uh, we'll do get point transform okay i'll cut these real quick just so it's less confusing all right so what we want to do here is now we have the point number and that's that's what's coming out of this element out is the point number so that doesn't give us the transform information so we want to plug that point number into another get point transform or not another but i guess this is get point transforms this is get point transform and on this guy we'll do file first input that's fine and now inside of this loop we're going to get the x form for each of our points and we can also use that point number to set the x form and it's all messed up right now because we're basically plugging in nothing so we want the target x form to be there and then we also want to take the point number and plug it again into here and now we're getting the distance for each point and we're using that as the collision for each of these collide geometries and we're setting the point of each point inside of this right so now that's, that sets all of them now so now i could i could do this foot this foot works fine i could do this hand probably gonna work real awful but you can see I, ca I can't move it any farther down than that so, so that's an easy way to to loop over everything you can you can use this looping setup on a lot of different stuff not just this uh collision distance thing i'm doing here but yeah so that that's uh that's the way i like to get accurate clean collisions and i like to do that up here first just so i'm not calculating a bunch of stuff because as, as you start to stack some of these controllers and some of these setups it starts to take a little bit longer. So when you have something you can do at rest, do it at rest so that it's not computationally heavy down the line. All right, I think that's gonna wrap it up for me on this one. I do wanna cover at some point how to get the collision proxy geometry for a ragdoll in a similar way. I think you can honestly even guess kind of how you would do that given the same method of name from capture weights and uh, the joints, uh, but, you, you can do a similar method to get accurate collision proxy geometry for ragdoll simulations uh, for all of the joints right away using a, a similar technique. So I'll, I'll go over that, I'm sure, at some point. But I do want to get into the controllers and some of the cool ways you can actually manipulate the rig itself, uh, not just the <laughs> boring setting up attributes and stuff. So uh, I'll, I'll be going over some controllers in the next one. Uh, Thanks for sticking around and watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. So actually, when I was cleaning up this file, I found a few things that I kind of wanted to also show. Uh, just some extra stuff we could do. Uh, if it, These are all basically performance optimization things. So I cleaned up this file, and I'll be giving you the hip file. Uh, I still have to get confirmation on if I can share this model or not. If not, then I'll still share the hip file, but you won't have access to the model here. But anyways, um, so I did a few things up here, and the big thing is I wanted to showcase how we can make this even a little bit faster, is if we compile the setup. So for one, uh, so for one, I also added uh, the option to bound a few different ways. So you can do a bounding box 
that's oriented. You can just do the bounding box. You can do a bounding box that's a sphere. I actually didn't change this one yet, but so this one should be a sphere. Or you can do a convex hull, which sometimes works a little better. Uh, there's also some other methods you can use for bounding, and I mean, feel free to use anything you want. And the other thing that I added inside the for loop here is this merge node. And you probably won't need this very often, but the idea here is if the joint uh, is somewhere way outside where the uh, mesh is, so let's say like the joint is up here and it controls the head geometry. And even though this is bound, it's not, it's still not going to be able to ray down on anything because it's not going to have, it's the joint's going to be completely outside the bounded geometry. So if we merge the joint in with the geometry here, let me just isolate and I'll show you a single pass. So we got this guy and we're bringing him in and we're merging him with this point here. Now that really wouldn't be a big deal in this scenario, but let's say I move this point somewhere over here. Now, when we bound them, it's going to ensure that the point is bounded inside of that merge where otherwise that wouldn't happen. So this is just kind of a, a safety net here. Uh, you don't necessarily have to use it, but I, I probably would. I'd probably put that in there. So the big thing I added here actually is the compile block. And I, I would like to talk a little bit about compile blocks if you haven't uh, used them before. Compile blocks basically work. You can use them on anything, really. And I'll make this black so it's a little easier to see. You can use them on anything. For the, I mean, OK, you can't use them on anything. But you can use them on most any node that is compilable. And you can see nodes that are compilable if you hit D in the uh, network editor and you go non-compilable soft badge. I usually make mine large just so you can see it. And let me find one. So you'll see nodes like, for example, this. This is a node you can't compile. Again, another node you can't compile. So these nodes would cause the compile block to fail. But outside of that, you can compile anything. And the idea is you put it inside these compile blocks. And then you can invoke it with these nodes, with an invoke compile block node. And that's, that's nice. And why is, that ni why is that nice? So that's nice because compile blocks can be multi-threaded. So if you have a computer, say, uh, a thread ripper with 32 cores, and uh, that would be 64 threads. So let's say you have a 64 thread thread ripper. That means that you can run this for loop on 64 different threads at the same time. So instead of having to go one iteration, two iteration, three iteration, four iteration, you go 64 iteration, 128 iteration, and so, so on. So it can, it can speed things up incredibly fast. Uh, however, in this scenario, it really doesn't matter that much because it's pretty light. But on heavier operations, it can be a pretty big deal. So all you really got to do there is you got to surround the for each block with a compile block. So compile end and a compile start. And on these compile uh, begins, I like to give them names. That way we can just use the name as the input name on this invoke. And the last thing you want to do is you want to do multi-thread when compiled on the end of the for each loop. Also, one important thing is for each input on your for each loop, you'll need another compile block begin. So I add that in there. Um, you can switch back and forth between those with this switch. I labeled everything pretty nice for you. And uh, that is it as far as the updates to the hit file goes. So I'll be sharing this with you guys uh, in the description. So all right, now, now I think we're done with this one and we can move on to the next one. So thanks for watching. So there actually is one more thing that I need to explain. And that's that when we're using a FBX character import, uh, regardless of if there's any animation on this third animated pose, uh, it still is going to have a clip info attribute, and it's still going to try and play through that. So even if it's just nothing, it's still reloading every frame. And we don't really want that because we don't want to have to reload all of these setups every frame because that kind of defeats the purpose of us making them at the start. So uh, easy way to fix that is just um, do a time shift. So do a time shift and I'm just gonna clear it out and make sure that we're locking it to the first frame so we only have to do these things once. We should be good. All right, now I will be moving on to the second tutorial. Thanks for watching.